live yet. We are live. We are live. One of our destinations could not be started. Instagram could not be started. So sad. Um, we will not worry about that. Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Marquart DeVoe, and I am the president, CEO, person in charge of Faith Culture Kiss Studios, the home of the Speak Easy Cooperative. And our company is here to support business owners like you who are creatives, who love people, who love to use their voices in all sorts of ways to understand how to run a business without hating their boss. And that's what we're going to talk talk about today. I'm really excited because we have two very cool people that do two very, very cool things to discuss what their businesses are like and how they no longer hate their bosses. So we have Robin and we have Gemma and I'm going to bring them on in just a few minutes. Want to get over some housekeeping for you. We would love if you would comment, talk to us. We want to answer questions. Don't be shy. Ask anything. We are open books. If something really goes over to an, in, you know, an uncomfortable place, we'll just tell you no. You can do that in the comments. Sarah is here. Make sure that when you um, are making a comment, we might not be able to see your name unless you've told Ecamm. There's a link in there to the live that uh, we're allowed to see your name. So we're so excited that uh, to interact with you today. And again, I just on a personal level, I'm so deeply touched that these wonderful humans would come and talk to you because we're going to talk about success actually looking like you and what that process can feel like when you start to see other people being successful. You start to see that it can be done a different way, but you don't see yourself in that story. And that's why we're going to talk to Robin and Gemma because they're going to tell you about what that journey is like and how we go from yeah, but not me to um, yeah, I'm totally doing that. So here we go. Welcome, Robin, and welcome, Gemma. Thank you for Thank being you. here today. Hi. This is so very cool. So Robin, I'm going to start with you because, or well, first I want to highlight what's so cool about this is that we're totally international today. <laughs> so Robin, you are in Canada. You're in Vancouver, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, Canada. Oh, Canada. And then um, Gemma, you are in the UK. But you're in like the beautiful northern countryside, right? I am. Indeed. I love it. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Friday night to be with us. And <laughs> oh, then, there's nowhere I'd rather be. <laughs> oh, thanks. And then I'm here in California in the United States of America. So I love that there's um, an international flair to today's hangout. Uh, Robin, something I'm so struck by around your journey and around your success story is that when we first met, you actually joined Speakeasy in order to do the how to run program accelerator. So you didn't have like really any context other than you had seen a friend who was part of it. And I don't actually know if, if there was anyone else in your world that was part of that process or if it was only Jocelyn. Shout out to Jocelyn. Um. Mm -hmm. And then one of our very first conversations, I remember you being like, I don't even like, am I, e I remember you asking me, am I even allowed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't and, remember saying that, but. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we were talking about transitioning, you know, kind of the ultimate goal of the transition that you're looking for. And, mm -hmm. you know, is this even possible? So uh, would you be willing to tell us a little bit about what it was like? in that place where, yeah, just about kind of your coming to the belief that this was something you could do and was for you. Yeah, well, I, like you said, I, I knew Jocelyn and we've worked together for a very long time and I had sort of seen her journey through taking this course. And um, I just, at the time I knew like, I, I didn't, I was just bogged down with pandemic and children and, you know, all of that. And then, um, yeah, about a year ago, I actually was doing some reading on women in business and what happens when women make money in particular in, in their communities. 
And uh, I was like, huh. And so Joss and I were out at this very fancy dinner and we were, and I was just like talking about, we have to do this. And she's like, I already do. <laughs> and, um, and then we just, she's, she's like, this is the class I took. And I said, I'm taking that class. And she said, do you want to just, do you want to join Seco? I was like, I don't know. Just, I'm going to take that class. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> no, I just knew right away, like I have to take it. And so like, you know, the next day, I think I looked on the website and I said, I'm going to take this class. And I, I sort of, like, it was just a given. It was just a given. I didn't even know that there was a whole Seco community behind it. Wow. And I also talked to Diane Spears, who had oh, taken yes. class previously as well and we had a little chat on the phone and she's like you should just try you should just do it like you can never you can never invest in yourself enough Mm. and I um yeah there was just never any doubt that I needed to do this and I it was funny like I had been saving money and I didn't know what I was saving it for and then that was apparently this class was it (laughs) that's amazing yeah yeah I I did not you didn't tell me that that is so cool I love that you brought up the importance the systematic importance of women making money in the world Um, I'm assuming you read, we should all be millionaires. Is that what you're talking about? So, um, because I was in Rachel's coaching program for a while and that I remember that being one of the reasons why I joined her program was because I so firmly believed, and I I'm a huge fan of Kelly deals as well because of this. I so firmly believe that we have the responsibility to make money in order to change systemic oppression that is brought on by patriarchy, brought on by bigotry, racism, and racist belief and behavior. And that when we choose to make money, we are changing the landscape of who has power in those decisions. Mm -hmm. And so I did not know that about you. And I am like having this really impactful visceral moment of being like, oh my gosh, it worked. Like, yes, that's why we do it. Like, I I feel like you just gave me a gift, Great. Like a reflection back. Yeah. Well, and it was, and I think that has always been a really important um, part of my life, like supporting women in developing countries and, you know, starting women starting businesses and all the amazing thing this, things that this does for the world in general in all aspects and like for child health and education and yes. war and like all of these things it just does amazing things when women are educated and running businesses and then what i figured out also i've been thinking about this a lot in the last 10 months was we also as artists have a responsibility to say what I do is worth a lot in financially, emotionally, um, who, you know, knowing who we are as a society and as individuals and as a group, um, what we do as singing teachers in, in this group is way more important than what what society would have us believe and it's up to us to change that mindset so making money as artists is really important i think we need to be seen as a crucial part of the economy i mean amen to that (laughs) i'm preaching to the choir i know but 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 here's the thing though yeah you are but these are messages the opposite of that message has been told to us so often that we need the counter to it so we can never hear it enough even if we know it we can never hear it enough Mm -hmm. so i'm so glad that you said that 
And now you're feeling what I'm hearing you say, and stop me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but what I'm hearing you say is that you feel like now you have the tools to actually make that core value of yours a reality. Is that true? Yeah, I, I have tools. I have knowledge. I have courage, which mm. I think is the main thing I took away is that I have the courage because I have the knowledge and I have the tools and I know how to do this and I know how to stand up for myself. I know how to speak really honestly. Like, I mean, <laughs> that's some really scary stuff that happened over this time, but not like scary. I want to run away scary. And like, okay, this is like challenge and I will take on a challenge anytime. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I just feel like I grew so much and I feel like I really know now what to do. I know how to, like, I find myself telling my students all the time who are in the point of like really early starting out in their teaching careers, some of them and, and in their performing careers, I'm like, are you really going to do that for $10 an hour? Really? Yeah. You know, and we're having some really interesting conversations and they're all like totally shocked. <laughs> some of the things I'm saying is that I'm like, look, I didn't, I didn't just figure this, like, this is just all new to me too. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, um, again, it's to that tearing down of systems, you know, and now you have the ability to do that. And then yeah. your, your students will not go out the way that other students go out having modeled for them, codependency modeled for them um, a lack of setting appropriate boundaries, having modeled for them, you know, n being nice payments that really actually just ruin the total economic landscape of what we do. Your mm -hmm. students don't, won't have that. Mm -hmm. They will have, I will charge an appropriate amount according to what my needs and financial desires are. I will be savvy about when I take exposure gigs and when I do not, and I will know how to do that well. I will, you know, like you, they have all these tools because you chose to invest in yourself. Um, I love it. Gemma, we have been working together for many years and I am so, I love that you did the How to Run program because what it shows me and what I take away from that is like, you can do it in in so many different ways. You can grow your business, you can grow yourself. And there's always like the right time to do something, even if you've been working on it a little bit over here and then over there. And would you talk a little bit about kind of your journey of being in Speakeasy for actually quite a while before you chose to take How to Run and then what that was like for you to take How to Run, even though you had already developed so much of your business just by being in Speakeasy. Yeah, well, I think from the moment I joined Speakeasy, I was definitely interested. I kept hearing about the How to Run program. I think when I joined, I couldn't afford it because mm. I was in a place where my business, I didn't have savings. So I actually probably had debts. No, I definitely had debts. <laughs> so right. one of the main, I remember people saying, it may have been you, Michelle, when I first joined is you need a budget. You need to know exactly what is coming in and going out. And I definitely was someone who I viewed myself as being terrible with money. And I remember making a post in the group and saying, oh, I'm really crap with money. And people sort of saying like, you're not crap with money, you need a budget, you need a system for knowing what is coming in and what is going out. And I did that. I was like, okay, then like, I know that's really obvious, but <laughs> I haven't been doing it. So um, before I knew it, I, I went and I did a budget and I cancelled a bunch of things I realized I didn't need anymore. And um, before I knew it, I had savings. And it was like, I've been someone who's been in debt for so long. Now I don't have debts. Now I have savings. And I felt like a completely different person. So, and then I would have coaching sessions with you, Michelle. 
and I'd ask about something and you'd be like well we cover this in how to run and I remember being like okay but I can't <laughs> afford that now I've got I'm a struggling artist who's got no money and um you know it didn't take me long to become someone who had savings and was like able to make cool decisions for my business like what am I going to do next I'm going to invest in a business course that's going to make me grow even more than I already have and yeah that I guess that was the the main process that led me to being able to make that decision yeah to be clear I did help you in those coaching sessions right I didn't just tell oh, you yes. how to <laughs> I can't you help just you like, now, no, you but if you take, no, never, ever. So you helped me, but you were also like, and we cover this in how to run. And then every time we had a session, you'd be like, oh, and like in how to run, we do this. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So mm. it was obvious to me that I needed to, because I was booking ad hoc sessions. Oh, that's right. You, yeah. Just kind of I, nice. I needed, I, I was very clear to me, I needed a program. I needed to be consistent and I needed to be kind of diving into something and not just kind of like coming to you with the occasional problem, you know, cause that's not what how to run is. It's not, it's not solving problems. It's, you know, it's not fighting fire. It's starting from the ground up, you know? And I knew that that's what I needed to do. What a great imagery. It's not fighting fires it's starting from the ground up. And that can sound really scary, right? Like, oh, I got to start all over again. But it's, it's interesting to me. And I'm wondering your both of your thoughts on this, like just ev it, so in my opinion, any, any artist, any singer, freelancer of any kind, but especially within the arts, the voice world, um, singer, songwriters, performers, uh, music teachers of all sorts, we spend so much time and money getting good at our craft. I am floored when people sh tell me all of the certifications they've taken around like vocal ped or how many years they've studied their instrument and all of the ways we've invested in becoming really good musicians. And then no one is teaching anyone. Sarah, Sarah just did a live about this on her sa savvy page. No one, well, we are obviously, but no one is, is being handed the tools to then monetize that. And I am, I'm, I hear what you're saying, Gemma, about that. And so you you had mentioned earlier before we were on camera that you had some thoughts about like the tools that you felt that you gained from the program. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And I think that when I think about me now and me before how to run and what the biggest change is, it's a real, almost like a, it's a huge but subtle change in that I almost can't remember who I was before because <laughs> I have this real subtle confidence now in myself as someone who runs a business. Whereas before I may have been a vocal coach. Now I'm like, I'm a business owner. And what I loved best about how to run was that, um, Oh, on the screen, it looks like I'm on my own. Oh, you're doing that on purpose. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I just got a shock. I looked at the screen. I could just see me and I scared yeah. myself. So, um, <laughs> I was like, ah! It's okay. What I did that on purpose. <laughs> okay. Just not used to it. So it's not a system of this is how it's done. Like if you want to make money, this is you need to do this, 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 and this. It's not like that. It's starting from the beginning developing tools that you can use for the rest of your life as a business owner. It's not necessarily just confined to being a voice teacher or vocal coach. It's very much like this is, these are the steps and the thought processes and the thinking tools and the, you know, strategies and the things that you need to go through in order to create a business that meets your values. Um, and I feel like I could start a new business tomorrow in a different 
field and use all of those tools um, again <laughs> and you know apply them to something else or I could um, interestingly I was in I go to a business networking meeting once a month and we had a little task to do yesterday and the task was to discuss in groups what we would do to prepare for a recession Ugh. and um, someone used the word pivot like we all pivoted for um, the pandemic <laughs> and I realized like I could use how to run should I ever need to pivot you know I and anything could happen and I could go back to everything that I learned from how to run and look at it from the start and grow something again you know it's given me this kind of like safety net that I know that no matter what I can figure it out you know from the start to finish and it will be something that I want to do and that is aligned with me and my values and my preferences and my strengths and it's pretty cool that yay <laughs> like <laughs> mission accomplished mission <laughs> accomplished Gemma thank you for saying that because I think you know there are a million business coaches out there a million literally I'm sure a million and there are several um and most most programs are insistent on a system do my system mm -hmm. and that's because there so just like there's legacy in voice teaching I don't know if you know this but just like there's legacy in voice teaching there's legacy in coaching so you are like, oh, this person is teaching this person's learned it from this person who learned it from this person. And if you go all the way back, oh, that's Marie Forleo or that's Taki Moore or that's Rachel Rogers or that's like you can like see these legacies. But the, the problem with that is that the message that is always sent is that it's the system that is successful and not the person with the tools making decisions that is successful. And it's easy to sell a system, my proven system, right? But it is hard to sell the supports and the guidelines and the knowledge around how to create your own system which is your own business right like robin's business the other two th the other thing that i want i would love for you to talk about is why don't you just talk a little bit about ideal client robin and then first before you do that just tell us what you do what your niche is and Gemma, you then tell us what your niche is because they are <laughs> not the same <laughs> Robin, what's your niche in terms of vocal students' ideal client? Well, I um, I specialize as a performer in contemporary classical music, and some of it is completely wacky, and um, and I love it. And I've been doing it long enough that I know how to kind of do it a little bit. <laughs> and I love teaching people how to how to tackle that kind of music and turns out believe it or not there's actually a lot of people who want to do that stuff yes and even and it's niche it's niche i'm you know we're not talking verity here we're talking like weird stuff <laughs> and but it's enough people who want to do it that i fill my roster like my it's full and it's so crazy. <laughs> I always thought I was the only one. And yet, like, that's that's what I do. So we do a lot of, you know, art song, a lot of contemporary stuff, but also a lot of old stuff. And But I just teach classical singing. That's it. And I figured out I don't have to teach all the other stuff because that's what I love to do. A amazing. Gemma, what, what would you say your niche is? Yep. Yeah, so I'm a contemporary vocal coach. Most of my clients are singer songwriters. Um, and I seem to have found myself a niche where I work with, I'd say most of my clients are like thirties and forties, age thirties, forties. 
some older and a lot of them have got like a really successful career in something else that is super like you wouldn't expect and they have also released these epic albums and incredible music at the same time um so i seem to have kind of found myself this niche of working with super creative super intelligent <laughs> hard-working driven kinds of people um which i really love because they come with these like amazing ideas for songs that they've written that are, like nothing i've ever heard before and i get to help them many of them play other instruments actually um a lot of my clients have come to me as i'm a guitarist or i'm a sing i'm a, I'm a drummer or something and i actually want to sing these songs that i've got in my head um so we're like, okay cool let's <laughs> figure out how to just how to sing them um so a lot of them have never had never done any singing before um so it's really cool to be like an early step in the part of this creative process and then a few years down the line to look and see how far they've come and for me to kind of know what's gone into that magic that has become this artist that is someone that you might not expect to even yeah. be the recording artist in the first place it's super cool i, I, I think see it now yeah i can i can totally see it now like Gemma, voice teacher to the hidden rock star <laughs> right like yeah i love it so robin talk a little bit about um we were talking before camera about your kind of journey around ideal client can you share a little bit about that yeah well ideal client is the first thing that we talked about in H2RA. And um, it was really eye-opening to go through it and ask all these questions about myself and the people I like being with. Like their questions like, what does your ideal client wear? And what kind of car do they drive? And you know, all these sorts of things And I was thinking about, it, I was like, oh yeah. My ideal client is not the 10 year old kid that gets driven around by their parents. It's actually the person who is taking the bus or riding their bike because they don't have a fancy Tesla. <laughs> they don't have, they don't have parents helping them anymore. And they're like, you know, twenties, thirties age. And you know, and, and what do they wear? Actually it was a really interesting question because then I realized, Oh, they see themselves as a professional or they're like working out all doing going to the yoga class and so they come like ready to like be physically active in their lesson i'm like right so the kid that shows up in their pajama pants is not my ideal client mm. <laughs> and that was so great and then because i'd been thinking like oh my gosh i guess i have to get certified in teaching how to belt and how to do how to do like you know all the people that come oh i want to sing pop i want to sing musical theater and all the stuff and i was like oh, okay i mean i like that music i've totally listened to it but i don't want to teach it and knowing that right out of the gate was this huge weight lifted off my shoulders i was like fabulous i get to just work with the people who I, who are really passionate about, again, this really niche market. And oh, I was so relieved. And I was also relieved to find out how many other people there are out there who absolutely want to teach the stuff that I don't want to do. There's all kinds of teachers out there. There's all, there's someone for everyone. And I don't have to be the be all and end all for every single person hallelujah <laughs> yeah it's so it's so true Gemma how when you do you, what is your experience with ideal client I'm so curious well I used to run I, I ran a um a studio I was in like a studio building um of my own in Hartford for five years something like that and I remember because I had this building space, I felt like I had to say yes to everyone that inquired. And I remember someone, a mum calling me saying that kid had a singing exam. It was a classical thing the next day. And 
they couldn't get in with their usual teacher and could I help? And I said, yes, and I couldn't help. You know, they came and they had a lesson and I tried to help them a bit with a bit of breathing and stuff like that. And I just, it was just an example of situations where actually it makes you feel like you're not skilled because mm. you're putting in situations where you don't have the skills for that. You, but you have a ton of other skills that are unbelievably valuable to other people. And I found that when I did go through that process of ideal client and using that in my marketing, the right people found me and loved working with me. And I felt amazing working with them and it felt easy. And, you know, I felt valued and it was energizing rather than feeling like you're letting people down by being like, oh, I'll try and do what you want, but it's not really my thing. It, it makes no sense the more you look at it. Yeah. It's so good. It It's really interesting too, because don't, don't we all assume like, oh, I have to be able to serve everyone as I won't X, Y, Z. I won't be popular enough. I won't be, I won't feel good about myself. I won't make enough money. Like, and all the reasons why we say that we have to be like Robin, you just said, end all be all. The reason why we think that is so wrapped up in our ego and in our money mindset. Not realizing that the exact opposite is true. Once you deal with that and you figure out who you really can serve, all those other problems disappear. You start feeling valued. You start making the right money in the right, with the right people. And so um, I know we kind of haven't really talked too much about the actual program other than kind of the results of it, but is there anything else that you will like, tell us about some hesitations you had? Well, you didn't. Robin was like, I have no hesitations. I'm doing this program, <laughs> which are my, I mean, I love hearing that. Um, Gemma, did you have other than, did you have hesitations or was it just really the financial investment? at the time and getting to the place where the financial investment investment was uh, reasonable for you? Um, I definitely felt scared. You know, I think when yeah. you embark on anything new, you feel that sense of like, ah, I don't know. Like it could, it could have been a financial thing. It could have been like, oh, whew, I'm going to do this kind of feeling. Mm. It wasn't about anything specific. I think having been in Speakeasy for so long, I had no doubts about the value I was going to get from it. Um, but I definitely, yeah, felt a sense of maybe it was knowing the work that I was going to put in because the work is uncomfortable, difficult, looking at yourself kind of work, you know, not necessarily like, five hours of spreadsheets like that that kind of thing it's like you know the deep work that we talk about and maybe I felt a little bit of um trepidation about doing that but I you know it was brilliant and the group that we were with was so amazing it was so nice and I'm sure we all had you know a day where we cried and you know in a good way not because anything bad happened but because we were all going through that process together, which made it much easier. Yeah, we do. I take, it is true that in this program, I curate every group. So whoever kind of winds up signing up first, um, I'm like, okay, it's like a, it's kind of like casting a show. And I think that I'm pretty good at it because I was a director for so long that I can like see which characters can come in and like really create some cool chemistry so i'm i'm glad that you brought that up Gemma, because that's not an accident like we we do applications on purpose it's not some people use it as a sales tactic to, to like create fomo or whatever they create it with but like we do application process so that i can say this person would be great for h2ra but not in this year necessarily not with these people like we're I'm we're working to create the environment the cohort not just whoever wants to do it I'll take your money you know what I mean so I love that you brought that up um and then oh Sarah Ramsey's here and she just was kind of saying something to here about the ideal client 
teaching outside of our zone and genius make us feel triggered into imposter syndrome. Absolutely, Sarah, that's good stuff. So practically speaking, how do you feel that H2, what, like what kind of tools practically do you feel you walked away with? Because of course we walk away with transformation, but what do you feel like you know how to do now that you didn't know how to do before? I love how both of you side the same way. <laughs> well, where to start? Um, well, you know, it's funny because it's just like some things now that I look at, I'm like, oh, Robin, that is so obvious. <laughs> Didn't you just do that before? Like the <laughs> ideal client. Like who is going to actually give me energy when I teach them and make like Gemma said, like make, make me feel like, oh yeah, I actually like know what I'm doing. I'm having a great time. I love my life. And then also like, just like, how do I schedule this stuff? How do I budget so that I can actually do the things that I like and not just work all the time? Mm-hmm. Um, that was really important to me. I grew up in a family where my parents owned a business and they always said to me, whatever you do, don't run a business. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, mom and dad. (laughs) Right. So, so that was always in my head. And then, and it's like, right. So don't be a musician. Don't be an artist and don't run a business. (laughs) Those are kind of the three things I was always told. And uh, well, sorry to disappoint, but here we are. Um, Oh my gosh, we did so much. Uh, Yeah, I think budgeting and knowing, like figuring out what is it that I'm actually worth in dollars. And that's not to say like, you know, my, uh, like, of course you're priceless. Right, right, right. <laughs> but what is my hour, like, if I spend an hour with someone teaching them how to read freaking Egyptian hieroglyphs on a piece of music, how much is that worth? Kind of a lot. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> like it's um yeah, I that was probably one of the biggest tools that I took away along with all of these other the, just the everyday practical stuff. Um I struggled with um the social media section just because that's something that I've never really been I've always been a little kind of freaked out by it. And now I've uh, totally embraced it. Just ah, yeah. Completely embraced it. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a tool, a tool, not an addiction, not something that's going to make me feel bad all the time because people are making bad comments about it. It's a tool that is like free that I can use to promote my business. And now I have all these tools in my backpack. I know how to use it properly and scheduling the time for it so that it just becomes, it's just this little microcosm of time that I, wherein I use, that I, wherein I do this job and it's just part of my job. And it's not like, you know, then I have to get sucked into like buying a mattress or some <laughs> stupid thing, right? Like it's just, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, that was just a huge, huge thing for me to see that that's like something that I can, Totally use and now and it's a great fit way for me to even stay connected with all the people in H two R A that I now I see them doing all these things and I'm so proud of everybody <laughs> I'm just so excited for everyone and and um, yeah that was that was a really big tool for me I don't know Gemma you probably have even better ideas than I do no I would say better um, my main thought first of all was that when I've gone back through the workbooks over the last few weeks, and I have, and I do daily, the one that I go to most is the marketing one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that really shed light on um, 
more of a structured way of doing it and understanding why but again choosing the bits that do that you like that you don't have to you don't have to do social media if you don't want to but if you do it's part of a plan and it's you know how are you going to do it and there being different ways of doing it but then i just realized now the biggest change i think for me has been remember your i hope i'm not giving away any content here michelle but it's stool okay. the stool and the legs yeah 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 no please <laughs> so the i know, i can't quite remember i'm going to let you explain it better in a minute but basically i've been trying to grow my business bigger than it has been for years and I always get to the same point and it kind of gets stuck and when you do what we do you're very much bound by time um so there's only so many clients you can see in a day or a week or a month um and looking at it differently growing it through thinking differently it doesn't have to be about time it doesn't even have to be about doing things because i'm i love one to one vocal coaching i absolutely love it but are there other things other ways i can use my skills that aren't all about one client one hour me and growing it in a more creative way that uses my skills but doesn't necessarily rely on hours in a day um that has been really cool for me i've had a lot of um ideas and i've kind of pressed forward with plans that i've had been in my mind for a long time but that I hadn't ever taken any action on yeah it's really cool to yeah. see how you're taking I also I also don't want to give away any of your secrets so it's like I'm really excited about what you're creating for this whole other um subset of your ideal client and I think I think I could say well what it looks say. like to me is like as wearing the hat as like vocal coach the singers are coming to you and you're finding out, oh, there are these like executives and these business people that are like these secret singers, right? And this new offer you're creating, it's like you're intentionally reaching out to the executives and the corporate. And it's just a different way of marketing, but then providing a service where you're, you're kind of getting to work with your ideal client just from two different mental subsets of that client. Like one subset will think of themselves as like the hidden gem and the other subset will be like, I need to know how to use my voice and then might find some sort of like artistry, yeah. you know? And that's really cool. Uh, yeah, multiple revenue streams and basically the stool with the legs is like, what are your, what are your revenue streams? Because that's another thing that, and it's not that only having one revenue stream is bad. That's not what we're saying. But it's this idea that we've been conditioned that the only way you can make money is that time for time for money, one hour, one client together, like you said. And um, people don't even think like, oh, I could I can teach one on one lessons in four different ways. Like I can structure that container in four different ways so that it's still one-on-one, -on -one, but it's not forcing people into doing it one way. It's like really serve uh, then, and this goes to the ideal client, right? Like we're thinking about what their time needs are, what their constraints are, what their budgeting needs are. We can offer several different ways to work with them within the context of our own, instead of like, these are my policies all the time. This is this, this is how it works, da, 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 you know? And, um, I have nothing against the take it or leave it. I, I, in fact, when people are first learning about their business stuff, I think they have to learn how to present take it or leave it because they're not strong enough. They're not developed enough in their boundaries to, to present take it or leave it. But once your boundary, you know, once we pendulum swing, you come back to the middle and are like, oh, I can create different versions of what I do. And some of it is, like you said, Gemma, scaled in terms of higher profit margin or in terms of volume of clientele in that hour. So that's a really, I'm really glad you learned that. That was not one. I thought you both were going to go for the marketing because I think, I think marketing is kind of like the sexy thing to talk about. Everybody wants to know how to market, which I think is really important. But if you don't know what you're marketing, <laughs> 
that's when it becomes like fear of social media, right, Robin, or the treadmill of just like vomiting things out into the world with no real purpose, right? So um, is there anything that you would like to say, like if there's someone watching this on the flip side and they're kind of like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Is there anything that you would say to a person who wasn't sure if they wanted to join our How to Run Your your Biz Without Hating Your Boss 10-month accelerator program? I would say if you're even remotely thinking about it, then just do it. Mm. Doubt's a normal thing to have, but if it's in your mind that, and you kind of fancy it, then you have a need for it and you should do it. That's a good word. Trust your gut. Yeah. Yeah, definitely trust it. It's, um, I would like to tell people that, uh, okay, 10 months feels like a, seems from at the get go, like a really long time. It's actually not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it actually went by so fast. I was like, wait, we're, we're done already. Like I couldn't believe it. Um, and it's, you do have to give yourself time during the week to think, just think, which was one thing I learned about myself. Thank you, Michelle, <laughs> for telling me that it's okay to just sit and think and that you don't have to be like scrambling and doing stuff all the time, but that it that that's a huge process to think about things. Um, and so it you you need to like devote time to it and it's worth so much. It's so interesting what you learn about yourself and the people around you. And then I think probably Gemma touched on this already a bit, but the space is so safe. It's so mm-hmm. safe. There are no dumb questions. And I guarantee if someone asks a question, says, this is a dumb question, but, and I'm like, oh, thank God. And then they ask something that I was just thinking of. <laughs> like, I don't want to ask, that's dumb. But like, we all of us want, even if it's something we, I feel like I maybe know, it's great to have a conversation around it to know that i'm in a place where we are all all of us how many of us were in this group 10 10 or 11 i think 11. all of us doing completely different wildly different things and knowing that at any point during that journey i could just message any one of them and they'd be like don't worry we got your back everyone everyone it's just like what a great way to know people without ever ever actually having been in a room with them <laughs> just so it was really wonderful to feel safe to experiment and ask dumb questions and ask smart questions and and um and to cheer each other on. It just, it's such a joy to be able to do that and to be able to see what people are doing now. It's exciting. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I think I love what you said about the, you know, obviously we can't control people feeling safe that, but I'm so grateful for the feedback that whatever we did do resulted in, in that for the group. And, um, you know, I think that it's hard there were several also advanced business owners in how to run. Um, Gemma, you've been doing this for a long time and Robin, you've been a performer, you know, you're all very successful people. And I think sometimes in groups, we don't pursue something, learning about something because we think we should know it already. And kind of that idea of the dumb question, like, I'm so smart, I'm so accomplished, I have all of these things that I've done in my business on kind of on accident, or it worked out for me because I did something right. And then we don't want to invest time and energy because that would show that maybe we didn't know it all, or 
maybe we were feeling uncomfortable about something. And I know I am always so impressed with the caliber of people, whether they're brand new Mm -hmm. to running a studio and they're just starting out or they've only been teaching five years all the way to people who have had met careers and sing professionally and gig, you know, all coming together in that space and saying, oh my gosh, same shit, different day. And we all have the same question. We just come at it from a different experience level, but it can be answered and we can answer it together. And the really experienced people inform the not as experienced people and the not as experienced people bring a freshness and a delight and a newness that we all forgot about because we've just been trudging along, (laughs) you know? So I, I love that you brought that up. Thank you so much. Both of you are so special to me. (laughs) This group is so so special. I want to thank you personally for being willing to um, help tell others about what we do here. And just thank you for sharing your day and your time and your story because we have to see it work for other people to believe it can work for us, you know? And I can write emails and I can write sales pages and I can try my best to convince people, no, really, we do really good work here. But um, hearing it from people who actually have been affected by it and done it is really high value. And I, I thank you for that gift to me and to our business and this company. Thank you for today. It's my pleasure. Anyone listening, if you feel stuck and you feel like you can't like you can't move, you can, (laughs) you can, I promise. (laughs) You're not stuck. You can, you can. Do you, um, go ahead, Gemma, were you going to say something? Did I cut you off? No, I think so. Yep. Okay. Well, you know, next year we're going to look at those profit and loss statements and we're going to see if you're you had that good return on investment, which I know several people already have a really decent return on investment. Um, but I know in just a year that we'll be like, oh, that's paid off. <laughs> that's done. You know, so I'm excited. Thanks again. And let me go ahead, go solo and close us out. Everyone, thank you so much. I know we only had a couple people here watching live, but I know people are going to see this on the flip side and I want you to invite you to reach out to us. I'm going to put the link in the comments about where you can apply and learn more about the how to run your biz without hating your boss program. We're going through applications and having good fit calls over the next few weeks. And then we kick off on April 4th. Okay. Have a wonderful rest of your day and have a great weekend. Bye.